podcast because it's a good one. I told uh, my guest today that she was on my wish list uh, for guests when I started the podcast, and she's here today. So I am, uh, I'm stoked. Uh, let's let's uh, give her a proper intro. Rita Rudner contemplated her next move when deciding that being a Broadway dancer would run its course. Fortunately for us, Rita, Rita saw the need for women in stand-up comedy during the boom of the 70s and the 80s. Rita's been an audience favorite ever since with a slew of uh, popular HBO specials and the longest-running solo female comedy act in Las Vegas where she won Comedian of the Year nine times in a row. Early in 2023, you can see Rita perform Staged, which she wrote with her husband, Martin Bergman, at the Laguna Playhouse, January 25th through February 12th. And you can also catch her perform with another guy on my wish list, Robert Klein, at select Florida shows in February and March. Rita's memoir, can you see it? My Life in Dog Years is available at RitaRudner.com, and you can get an autographed copy for just a buck more than you get it at Amazon. And it is a fantastic book. We're going to talk about that. Let's bring her up right now. It's Rita Rudner. Hi, Hi Rita. This is Betsy, and she wants to do her act before we go any further. Okay. So ask Betsy <laughs> if she knows the answer to the question. Uh, do you know the answer to the question? Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> okay, ask her if she can play the piano. All right. Can you ask her to play the piano? Yeah, oh yeah. That's it. That, and she then, plays with a flourish. I like that. You're being shy. Okay, that's <laughs> good. Four three. We don't do more than three. <laughs> She's good. She is. She's talented. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I found the book to be compelling as a fan. Um, I, you know, I've always been a fan, and I've always just known the act. I'm I never did a deep dive into what Rita Rudner was all about, and uh, you know, it's a it's quite a story. You definitely have one of those lives that would uh, naturally lead to stand up comedy. Uh, because I have a happy demeanor and I'm a happy person, people kind of say, you know, I don't see a lot of comics, you meet them and you immediately know that something went horribly wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With me, it's kind of buried far deep in the past and it came out in different ways. But um, my, you know, you know, from reading my book that I left home at 15 because my mother had passed away, I was sick most of my life. And my father married somebody who just didn't want me around. So <laughs> people say, why did you leave home when I was 15? And I say, I was asked to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it really was, um, I think, you know, people deal with, uh, ad with adversity in different ways. And my adversity was very extreme because uh, of my mother being so sick most of my life. Mm -hmm. So I did it with... Um, kind of an absurd dedication to different things that occupied my mind in a way where I kind of could get past what was going on in my life and go on to a different chapter. So I, my mother started me in ballet when I was four. I was immediately good at it and I showed an aptitude for dancing and I became obsessed with dancing and I want to be a dancer on Broadway was pretty much all I would say from the time I could talk. Because uh -huh. <laughs> <And, laughs> my mom took me to all these lessons and I always, I just wanted to be a dancer on Broadway. And I think, as I said in my book, I, um, I was exhausted most of the time because I would wake up when I moved to New York and start my classes at 10 and I'd get home at eight and I just kind of collapse. So mm -hmm. I think occupying my mind was part of not really dealing with everything that was going on in my life. And, but that was the dancing part. And then I think I did the same thing with comedy for a long time. Mm -hmm. Your dad was such a unusual character and he, uh, sense. I think he is the, uh, the definition of an outlier. 
he uh, he really does his own thing and did his own thing and uh, just didn't really compromise for anyone. He, you know, I used to think he it was very supportive of me because I was, you know, I left home at 15. But I, in retrospect, he was very lazy and he found it less energy was spent on getting me to do something else rather than letting me do what I want. So uh, he was a lawyer who didn't like confrontation, which is why we weren't a wealthy family. Yeah. And we went through a lot of, because um, my mother was so sick and we had no health insurance because he didn't believe in insurance. So we ended up kind of, you know, dollar for dollar trying to figure out enormous medical bills. And then just to show you that he wouldn't learn my stepmother became ill too and he still wouldn't get health insurance and went through the same thing and had to sell our silverware. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like he didn't learn anything from the past and he just kept doing what he wanted to do. So I think um, his, his degree of laziness was really why I got to do my own thing and continue on my own path because he um, felt it was an easier, easier way to live. Yeah. When you get to a certain age, uh, like, like we both are, you, you reflect and you try to, so when you're younger, I, I had parents that, you know, were not, not, not the ones I would pick out in, in, in some cases. And, uh, so I was always trying to make sure that I didn't have the traits that they had that I didn't like. Uh, so when I get older, I start looking back a little bit and I start realizing I do have those traits and I, I just don't let them take over my life. Do you, because in the book, I, I, I'm setting this up because in the book, I see some traits of your dad that are evident in you um, that, uh, I think probably helped you. Do you, do, now that you are able to look back at uh, your childhood and his life, do you see any of those traits that are a positive in your life? No, tell me what they are. Because well, I, see I see we try, I mean, because he was so lazy, I've always been ultra ambitious. Mm -hmm. And um, I always tried to be the opposite of what, he was even as a parent and as a partner and mm -hmm. as a professional person because mm -hmm. i i really didn't admire at the you know when you're a kid you admire your parents and mm -hmm. I, yeah but i i just don't want to be like him so tell me what you see so i can get rid of it <laughs> you don't want to so it's really three things first off you have your own mind you you aren't uh you aren't you can't be pushed around or persuaded by others to do things that you don't want to do. That's um, true. Absolutely. And the second one is you're very good at making decisions and living with the decisions that you make. Those are both true. Yeah. <laughs> they are. And, and and there's a third one. And I think I, I think I forgot it. It'll probably come up. But th those were the main two. I, I just see you as and, and also you're you're a bit of an outlier in the, you know, even, even in your comedy, it's so evergreen and it doesn't follow trends. It, you know, I watched your first Letterman special and really the only joke in there that wouldn't resonate today was the Howard Johnson's one. And you know because, what? It does because <laughs> I was doing a, a book. Uh, a book event, and people asked me what were some of the first jokes that I wrote. Uh -huh. and that was one of the first jokes about Howard Johnson's, uh, it's, if it's not your mother, it must be Howard Johnson's. Yeah. And all I have to do is remind somebody that that was the, uh, that was the joke at, at that point. And the punchline still works like magic. So oh, yeah, the punch, the punch is fantastic. It's just the, you know, young people wouldn't know the setup. Yeah, but people, if you would say Howard Johnson's just came out with this now, and uh, if it's not your mother, it must be Howard Johnson's, I could still go with it. But I, I like to be honest. And I said when I would, because I haven't done the joke for what, I don't know, 30 years, 20 years, yeah. whatever it was. And I said, um, this was the thing. And it still worked. In fact, my very first joke that I ever wrote still works. 
um, because again, it's evergreen about right. I wanted, um, my boyfriend and I broke up because he wanted to get married and I didn't want him to. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if, you, if you have a joke like that, and that, those are the kinds of jokes I always strive to write, but I've, I've had to include so many things now that I don't think will be relevant in um, 10 years, but I don't think I'll be doing comedy in 10 years. <laughs> so <that's> yeah. <laughs> you had lived, be, because you moved out at 15 yeah. and started dancing, you had lived quite a life by the time you started doing stand-up. I mean, you really, you, you live more life than a lot of people do in a lifetime. And then when you start, <laughs> when you started doing stand-up, you started getting, uh, you know, what I call notes, people telling you, you should do this and do that. And, uh, you know, wear the wedding dress and the bow and say, you need a man and, and, and things like that, because you were different from all of the women who were performing comedy at the time. What was it? Do, do you, do you think, and it's really just theory at this point, do you think that because you had, achieve this level of maturity just by living the life that you had and working like you had, that you were able to take those pieces of advice and say, yeah, that's not for me. Well, what, what I, what I did was I always listened to the audience because mm. that's who I'm working for. I'm not working for someone who's telling me what to do. I'm working to entertain an audience. So, if an audience is laughing, I'm doing something right. If an audience isn't laughing, I'm doing something wrong. So I, what I, the persona that was closest to who I am as a person, that was the thing that was working. So mm. when anyone would ask me to change it, I would say, why would I change it? It's working. Right, right. <laughs> Looking for a magic bullet. I would put a bow on in my hair and wear the wedding dress, but I wasn't because I was on the road to something that was could build into something else, could build into something else. So I kept doing what was working, and the audience is my boss, and that's who I work for. That's fantastic. Now, you you have had a consistent stage persona and act pretty much since the first TV appearance I saw you on, mm -hmm. um, you know, great, you know, great, great jokes. And, and you always keep writing, but, um, what did it take you to get there? What, when did you decide that the jokes you were writing and, you know, say your first 10 minutes of comedy were what you were going to be as a comedian? I never really made a conscious decision. I always did things that were comfortable to me and, you know, what I would want to say. If I have, if I have trouble saying it, then it's a thought that I discard. And mm -hmm. if I like saying it, then I say it again. I mean, it's just that simple. It's not a scientific thing, but I did study joke structure very intimately when I began, because I think if I, the ballet background that I had, you don't dance, uh, you know, a pas de deux or swan lake or anything until you know first position, second position, third position, and then you you do you don't dance till you do bar exercises. You know, it's step by step by step. So I never threw myself into something and said, I have ten minutes. I said I have thirty seconds. <laughs> Wait <laughs> a minute. Now I have two minutes. And once I could put it all together, um, then I as in my book, you know, started auditioning for the Letterman Show, and uh, I think before that I was on for four minutes in, I forget all the names of the specials, but I got picked out as the newcomer in a Catch a Rising Star special with uh, Billy, Billy Crystal, and I, I can't remember, I know Pat Benatar was on it, and Robin Williams, and, I, and Andy Kaufman, and I just did, I think, three to four minutes there, and then I expanded another minute, you know, it's just, it's just crawling time by time by time to try to get a new thought and then to try to uh, position it where it's a seamless um, flow into the next segment. So I, I'm still trying and I'm always trying to become more organic because I tend to, because I'm not an outgoing person, I tend to rely on a punchline rather than an attitude. 
And I've always been envious of people who could just go on stage without that much specific material and punchlines and get huge laughs. Uh I'm always trying to figure out a little bit how to have more, um, to be more animated. Because even though I try my best to be animated, people always describe me as understated. And Mm. I, I think it's important to keep trying new things and to, but I'm not, that's not who I am naturally, but you just don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over, especially when I was in Vegas doing show night after night after night. If I didn't try something new somewhere, I would be bored and the audience would be entertained. So it's a it's a kind of a, a, yin, a yin and a yang. It's a yin and mm-hmm. Did you treat the writing part of stand-up like a job and did you have like a set time that you wrote or was ways. I remember being in a cab with Jerry Seinfeld because he at that point was the big deal in the clubs when I was just starting. And I said, Jerry, how you know how do you do it? Because I'm just learning how to do it. And he said, It's my job. Yeah. <laughs> and I sit down and I write for two hours a day. It's my job. And I'm like, oh okay, it's his job. So I had a writing partner for a while who I loved. Her name is Marjorie, passed away. And we would sit there and, and think funny things together and write together. And then Fred Stoller and I sometimes would go to libraries and sit at the library for an hour and try to come up with something. And then sometimes I just read a book. And then at a, at a point in a chapter, because my mind wanders, it would spring into something or take a walk, just different. There's no one way to be creative. If there was one way to be creative, creativity would be easier. For sure. You you mentioned that you wanted to break down joke structure and understand it. Now, did you do that by watching other comedians or did you find a book or what, what, what was it that? I watched other comedians night after night. I read every book I could read in the library about jokes. I listened to every comedy album I could get out of the Lincoln Library. I went to the Museum of Broadcasting to look at old Jack Benny shows and George Burns show, Woody Allen stand-ups and you know anything. I just decided to go on my, I would go to, um, if they had movie movie uh, festivals in New York where I, would, I learned about Jacques Tati and Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and Preston Sturgis and uh, all these you know great comedy writers. So uh, George George S. Kaufman reading his plays. There's all I went to comedy school by myself, and every mm-hmm. day I would just do it, and I would do something with comedy. And every night I would say, it doesn't matter where, I have to get on stage and do some say something into a microphone. So I think it's that dedication that kind of spurred me along where I could catch up with people, because mm-hmm. comedians are, as a um, a group are lazy, <laughs> except for Jerry yeah. Seinfeld. <laughs> I think he's an exception to the rule. <laughs> and he was one of the people that I um, learned from. So um, I just said, you have to do it all the time. If there's an old joke, it doesn't matter when you call a comedian, you wake them up because they can just be sleeping at four o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock in the morning. They can just always right. be asleep writing a joke. And um, I think because of my background, this was disciplined. I was a bit more disciplined and I was able to catch up with people even though I started late. I think that um, it's it's evident that you did well at the beginning because of Rodney Dangerfield finding you. And I don't, you know, as far as Rodney, not only being a great comedian, but he was a probably the biggest fan of comedy of his time and he recognized greatness in just about everybody that he brought on stage. I mean, and, and you are like probably the most unusual act based on his comedy and like Sam Kennison and some of the other people that he put on, he just recognized funny as being funny. How did that feel when, when Rodney uh, brought you on his show? Well, the first time he saw me at Catch a Rising Star, I had a very good set, and he pulled me aside and he said, I saw your set, it's very funny, Uh, takes a long time, sometimes you never make it. (laughs) Thank you, thank you for that, Rodney. He said, I just want you to know, 
It doesn't matter that you're good. You're, you could be nothing could have happened to you for long. But will you be on my comedy special? And I yeah. said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very, very much. And it was uh, a special that turned out to be on people's radar even – how long ago was it? Like in 80-something? Oh, something? gosh. It, it, was, uh, it was 80 – was it 82? 82, 80, somewhere in the – or I don't know. But it's still on people's radar, and people still want me to do some of the jokes that I did on that uh, show that I barely remember. And it introduced Sam Kinison. And mm. um, it was also Louis Anderson, who became a really good friend of mine. And Sam was a good friend of mine. And uh, I think it was Bob Saget was on the show as well. Yeah. And um, a few other comedians that Bob Nelson, who was a very funny guy. So, I mean, it was a, it turned out to be a good special that stood the test of time. Yeah. So I was, I was very lucky, but I always tell my daughter, you know, the only way to get lucky is to get out and do things. If yeah. you stay home and don't do anything, you're not going to get lucky. So right. when I got lucky was that I was at that comedy club every single night. I tried to get on every single night. And the night he saw me, I had a good set and um, he put me on the show. If I had decided that night, you know, I'm just going to stay home and watch Murder, She Wrote, it, it wouldn't have happened. You, you've just got to get out and do things. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot harder. Even now, it's a lot. Every, everybody says you just got to get up. You got to get up and you got to practice. You got you to gotta do the mics and all that. And everybody thinks that it's all fun, but going up every night, they're they're really after the first time in a week there's nothing fun about it i know that and it's it's it, it, that, that's what it really is work but i always had fun i always had fun hanging out at the bar with everybody mm -hmm. and trying out a new joke and going from comedy club to comedy club it didn't work here it went over there i even had fun you know working gigs in new jersey that we got lost on the way in a bad car and ended up in parking lots and didn't know we were working. It was still fun. I've always, that's one thing when, in my career when I was on Broadway and dancing and summer stock and industrials and all the things I did, I loved it. And every single thing in uh, I've done in show business, in my comedy, I've really enjoyed. So if I, if I could say anything is if you're doing something you enjoy, you're, you're almost all the way there already because mm. That's, I, I was listening to um, Howard Stern interview Bruce Springsteen, and he was something, you know, I got paid a fortune for something I do for free. And that's same, the same for me, except for the fortune part. But mm -hmm. I, I still made a very good living, and I did what I wanted to do, and I was independent. Mm -hmm. Did you, it, it doesn't seem like it, but was there ever a danger of you falling into the substance abuse issues that were so prevalent at the, at the time? No, it never occurred to me. It's just, it's not on my radar. Um, people told me afterwards that everyone was doing drugs downstairs in the basement and Catch a Rising Star. And I said, there was a basement. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I, it's, you know, it's just not who I am. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment. I know people go through different things and, you know, they learn. And a lot of my friends have been through recovery and I applaud them. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that, um, ever occurred to me mm -hmm. see that's another thing you got from your dad you know he yeah. he did what he wanted to do yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i got contacted by this um boy who was in high i was in high school with and i can't remember his name now jim somebody and he said do you remember me and i did uh remember because he sat next to class and me in the class and tried to get me to do drugs and uh -huh. i said I said, stop it, I don't want to. And he said, but you're very tight, you need to loosen up. And I said, what I need to do is go to ballet class after school. So <laughs> it just never, I, I shut up. So, I mean, there's always gonna be a bad influence and it so isn't something, I don't, I just didn't know. <laughs> So this is this is totally a uh, squirrel and off topic. But when I was looking at clips of you, uh, 
you became, uh, especially with Martin, but uh, even before that, you became friendly with a lot of folks in the United Kingdom. And there's a clip of you doing a sketch with Stephen Fry, who, who's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, it's the World Cup ske sketch yeah. where he is an American. And I've never seen Stephen Fry do an American accent before, and he did it perfectly. Can you tell me about the time you spent overseas and anything that you learned there? Well, that's how I met Martin, was that he, he's in, from London, and he hired me, he was a comedy producer and writer, and he hired me to do shows in Edinburgh, and at the Edinburgh Festival with a, a man who, two of my really good friends still to this day, Larry Amrose and Bill McCarty. And then um, from there, Martin is very well connected in um, English show, in comedy in England because he was president of the Cambridge Footlights and he, Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry and Emma Thompson were all, um, they were co-patriot, co co what do you call them? They, co they were, yeah. Yeah, but that is a different word. But anyway, they were his um, comrades. No, I'm in Russia now. Um, <laughs> they were his friends from, his friends from um, Footlights. So when Martin and I started writing movies together, uh, when we got together in Australia, he was producing shows in Australia and he hired me to do shows there. And we started trying to write movies. And again, it, one of my, I like to give advice to, that, um, to people in my book about things that have worked for me and things that haven't worked for me. Just because some people, a lot of people want to be in show business and no one ever, I tell my daughter because she wants to be a singer songwriter and she's working very hard at it. No one invites you to be in show business. You've got to work your way into show business. And when the opportunity comes, you can't say, well, now I'm going to get ready because the opportunity is gone. So you always have to get ready before the opportunity comes. And Martin and I started writing movies and we wrote movies for a couple of years together that were very bad because they're going to be bad before you know what you're doing. And then I started courses and uh, movie writing courses, and we started studying movie structure. And by the time when um, Emma was married to Ken Brannett at the time, and they were they were staying with us in our house in Los Angeles, and Ken had a, a castle in England, in um, I forgot near Potter's Bar, outside London, where he was going to film a movie, and he didn't like the script he had. And Martin and I said, "We've got an idea for a movie. Let's write a movie. And let's give it to Ken." So we did, and that's another thing. You, when an opportunity is there, we'd been writing movies for years, and we'd learned, and then we had an idea, and Ken liked it, and he contributed, and that was our movie that we got made, Peter's Friends, which was very successful. That's that's great, and the the thing about the uh, the movie writing was you just wrote so many of them that you got paid for, but never saw the light of day. Um, I always stopped doing it because I just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, it, it, it seems like that would wear on you. It does. One of my friends, uh, who's a very talented movie writer, Ron Zimmerman, said he was always writing movies. He said, I don't call them movies. I call them novels with, um, with stage directions because <laughs> people read them and they never get made. So it's, it's what um, Hollywood is based on is – paying, you know, we, we did really, really well financially. But the thing that stand-up gives you, me being a stand-up and Martin being a producer, is enormous freedom to do what we want to do. And once something stops being fun, we don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we wrote movies, I guess, for almost 10 years in Hollywood. And at, at the point it stopped being fun, we said, why don't we go back to what we do where we don't have to listen to anybody telling us executives telling us what to do and that's when i got my own show in vegas and was successful there for a long time mm -hmm. and martin you know many times through the book kind of saw the future before it happened in in a lot of cases um do you do you feel like that uh he is seeing anything now that might be uh, that might be something that's coming up that's uh, going to be the next big thing. He always sees something. I yeah. told him he having ideas. That's why we're doing a play, just because it's fun, and yeah. we're 
it with our friends who we always work with, and it's a comedy. And Mike McShane is, who's in a really fine comedic actor, who's in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and whose line is it anyway? Um, he's playing opposite me, and a couple, and a few of our other friends who do a lot of improv are in the show. And um, we're going to do that. And then he has another idea after that. We're going to try, even though he promised me he wouldn't have any. He's the one with the ideas. I'm I'm a person I can uh, be funny from eight to nine thirty at night doing a show, yeah. and he, he's funny when he wakes up, and then he doesn't stop. He's just a, he's a go getter, and he'll do things like he plans these things, and they like you know he said let's do a let's do a tour of England, and he'll plan it, and it'll work out, and then let's do Australia, and then that'll work. In fact, the house I'm sitting here now. We, he said, I always wanted to build a house. We were walking on the beach one day, and he said, let's knock that one down. Okay, well, let's <laughs> knock it down. And now we built it, it took four years, but it's a really pretty house. So he's, uh, he's, not, he's not boring. Yes, that's, that's, that was evident in the book. Yeah. Now, as long as you did Vegas, I mean, for, for so many years, what was it like to finally pull away from that? It, it happened very gradually. Because uh, I did I get five or six years at New York, New York, and then a few years at Harrah's, and then a few years at the Venetian, and then I went back to Harrah's, and then um, uh, the pandemic came, mm -hmm. and I was already starting to not do as many shows a week because I started out doing you know three hundred and sixty shows a year. I, mean, I was over you know for years and years and years. And then, um, as is my in my book that nobody knew, I, I got sick for a while when I was in Las Vegas, and um, I got very, um, very wonderful people who kind of supported me through my illness. And I didn't do as many shows for a while. Instead of five shows a week, I do three shows a week, and that was for about a year. And then the next year, I was kind of recovering. So. When the pandemic came, I had a new contract with Caesar's Palace, and there was a room I was going to be in called Cleopatra's Barge, which is a really nice, intimate, you know, room that was perfect for my style of comedy. And then the pandemic hit, and everything closed down. And then they renewed the contract and said, "Let's do it to the next year." And then. They closed, it got closed again, and then they closed the room permanently. And by that time, I said, you know, it's about, let's do different things. So Martin and I wrote a play. We had already written a play that got transferred to New York right before the pandemic. And we had people interested in putting that off Broadway in a larger production, but then everything went, went kind of crazy. And I just figured, you know, I've been working since I was um, 16. Mm -hmm. and the pandemic kind of caused me to slow down and write a book. So I did something a bit different with my time. Yeah. And I just got a new contract in um, a new casino in Las Vegas where I'm there three weeks next year. Okay. And that's and because otherwise I'm on the road with Robert Klein and I'm doing book events and I'm doing this play. And I like to spend the summers with my daughter and my husband doing different things. We did it. A uh, really fun tour of Europe this time um, last year, last summer. So I like to kind of vary it and not be so concentrated anymore because I don't have to be. If it's not fun, don't I don't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't like zip lining. Oh God! <laughs> zip lining. I did whitewater rafting. I did kayak because Martin's not. He's not athletic, and I'm the athletic one in the family. But I'm athletic because I can play tennis and dance. You know, yeah. I was not not a daredevil, but I didn't want to deny Molly any of the experiences that she would have had had I been a younger person because I didn't adopt Molly until I was 49. Mm. So luckily, I was in uh, good enough shape to do all of the activities with her that she wanted, that she wanted me uh -huh. to do for us at, on, at, on land. <laughs> yeah. When when you find yourself in a position where you're writing a memoir and you you have to force yourself to go and relive all these times in your life, did anything come out of that 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 uh, you 
didn't realize on a conscious level that that all of a sudden came out and you realized something about yourself that you didn't know before you started writing it? Yes. I the things that were most fun to write about were the times with my daughter and mm. the times with my husband. And the things that weren't as much fun um were the when the times that I was struggling by myself. So mm. I I just think the time spending more time with family, as somebody once said, you know, no one is ever on their deathbed saying, I wish I'd spent more time at work. Even though my I love doing what I do and I love comedy, I just really cherish all the, the vacations that we've taken, even though, even though I don't really take vacations because I always end up doing a show wherever I am, because that's just the way Martin is built and the way I'm built. I always work. So even this summer, when we went to uh, London to visit some of his friends, and then we went to Venice because I love Venice and wanted to show our daughter Venice. And we, I, I got a job on a cruise where I had to do two shows for two 45 minute shows. And we went uh, on one night, I just worked for one night and we had a fantastic vacation going to uh, Mykonos and Crete and mm -hmm. Persia and all these, you know, wonderful places. We went to Balta, you know, places I didn't even know existed. So, but I still did two shows. <laughs> 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 On our honeymoon, Martin walked around the hotel and said, "You could put a, you could do a show over there." Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, fun fact: you got married the same year I got married. Oh wow! What What's your anniversary date? The twenty fourth of June. Uh, mine's June fourth, so we're just twenty days apart. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. how's it going? Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> very good it's funny the, the the cigarette smoking thing you know um when i met my wife i was a cigarette smoker and um that didn't stop her from dating me but at, probably just a few weeks in she said she didn't like it and i just crumpled up that pack and threw it away and never touched them again <laughs> well i just martin was a smoker and i i said i like him and I'm not telling him not to smoke, but I can't get involved with someone. I can't have cigarette smoke at home because at the clubs, that it was still where people could go and just blow smoke at you while you were telling jokes. And yeah. I had to come home smelling like the Marlboro Man because it, you had to wash it all off out of your hair. It was just all, you know. So I said, I, I can't live with that at home, even though I really liked him. And every time he would come to um, through New York looking for shows, he would always take me out you know to a broadway show or you know to dinner or something but we didn't get involved till we stopped smoking yeah <laughs> good call mm. yeah <laughs> there's uh here in the south there's uh the smoking is not really outlawed so it's most bars have uh discontinued smoking but there's still a few and I do open mics at a couple of them and it's, it's not good. It, it, it's, it's just like what you experienced. You have to take a shower before you go to bed or you wake up smelling like you were at a bonfire or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you got, a, so early on you got a lot of advice that really wasn't, um, it wasn't good advice. Did you get any, good advice that you still use to this day? Jerry, it's my job. Yeah. <laughs> I sit down and it's my job. <laughs> I, I think I read somewhere where um, somebody asked you about your joke writing and you, you say you, uh, you said you buckled down and wrote a bunch of jokes when you needed a new house. It, it was something, <laughs> something like that. that help. It always helps. What really helps is the um, the the fact that television is so um, you you have to just keep feeding the they call feeding it the monster because mm -hmm. once it's on vaudeville they you know they used to tell me they could do the same act for years and years and years and they'd go from place to place to place and then a new place you know and people would want to hear the same jokes but when you do television you can't keep repeating the same jokes and when I came home. The first time I did Letterman, um, my I had a doorman named Caesar, 
And he said, uh, I, the next morning, he said, I saw you on Letterman. You were really funny. When are you going to be on again? And I went, oh, my God, I only have five minutes. And I had to get to the clubs to, to keep writing jokes. So it never, it never kind of ends. Rodney Dangerfield used to tell me. He always thought that the last joke he, write, he writes was always going to be the last joke he would ever write because mm -hmm. he was thinking of more things. So it's always constantly on my mind, even though I've kind of diversified now with um, Martin and I writing plays and books. Mm -hmm. Do you pay uh, much attention to stand up now, the 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 younger stand ups? No, I don't. It's it's like doctors watching medical shows or lawyers watching um, lawyer lawyers on TV because mm -hmm. it's uh, something you want to get away from. And I love good comedy. And I think that women are allowed to be funnier, much funnier now than, mm -hmm. you know, regular women. It was always goddess women who were, you know, from Marilyn Monroe on. It mm -hmm. was the gorgeous blondes who were the new comedians. And now people are realizing that regular women are also funny, which I think Saturday Night Live has a lot to do with it. And when I was watching comedy, one of the things I loved was Second City, and it was it was one that I used to watch where Martin Short and Andrea Martin and Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy, the one from Canada. Yeah. And I just I just loved that. I thought that was terrific. And you know, Catherine O'Hara and Andrea Martin are two of my very favorites now too, because it's just because comedy is so run by our show business, I think still is so run by men who have fantasies about what a funny woman should be like and what a funny woman should, what kind of funny woman should be on television or in movies. It's kind of getting to be a bit more liberal like that, where Amy Schumer can star in a movie, Tina Fey can star in a movie. It doesn't have to be um, Kim Basinger and Michelle Pfeiffer, even though I'm sure they're really good actresses and very nice people. Mm -hmm. I would call them the new comedians. And really, when you look at the beginning of Late Night with David Letterman, Meryl Marco really had, you know, he she was the one that kind of shaped the silliness of it all. She was wonderful. I, I knew her a little bit. And um, we went, we did a TV show together in Boston. I think Tom, oh, anyway, he had a show in um Boston and Meryl and I were on the show together. So we went to the airport together and we spent some time together and she was just uh, had a, just a really funny persona mm -hmm. and just a funny aspect uh, of a look on life. And she, she wrote some of, said some of my very favorite things like a woman's dessert is always located right in the middle of a man's dessert. Yeah. And that's <laughs> the best bit of the, <laughs> the dessert. And she was, she was just a, a wonderfully, still is a wonderfully funny woman. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, she was fantastic, and 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 in reading, it's funny when the Slutterman podcast that I talked about at the beginning came out. I I hadn't really thought a whole bunch about the old Dave Letterman. I watch his new Netflix shows and and things like that, but I hadn't thought about it. But and I'm not a very nostalgic person. But then all this nostalgia started sweeping in, and I wanted to go back and and read about everything that he did then and all the people behind it. And Meryl, you know, she was such an integral part in shaping I'll that. He'll give her all the credit in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. I've got a segment on the show. Um, I don't know if you caught this or not, but it's called, Is This Anything? And okay. this is where we each bring a joke or a premise or something to the table, and we just do a short workshop of it. And uh, I've, got, uh, I've got one uh, teed up, and uh, if you don't have one, that's totally fine. But as the guest, you get to decide if I go first or you go first. You go first. Okay. So this is a Rita Rudner inspired joke right here. This is uh this is something that I wrote after watching a lot of your humor. And here it comes. It's no exaggeration when you hear that being a grandparent is one of the greatest things you can experience. My grandkids love me unconditionally. They call me Pop Pop and I don't have to worry about the, being a major contributing factor for them needing therapy when they grow up. Ta-da. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? <laughs> I 
I'm trying to figure out how to make that into because you'd have to you'd have to introduce the fact that most children blame their parents for things mm. because you um, I'm I'm extra nice for them because I to them because I don't want I don't want to be brought up in there but there see therapy sessions aren't a good punchline in their psyche so I would I'd have to work on that but it would have to be more specific about what you were doing rather than being nice to them. I mean, I remember seeing a Bill Cosby bit where he, he did a bit about um, her, his grandparents being nice to his kids, even though they were mean to him because now they wanted to get into heaven. So mm -hmm. I, didn't, I, mean, I didn't say it right, but that's something like that. Cause heaven is a, is a more specific image uh -huh. of what they wanted to do. So I would have to, I don't think they're going to complain about me when I don't want them to complain about me in therapy. So therapy, therapy instead of therapy sessions, but I'm really nice to them because I don't want them to complain about me in their therapy. I want them oh. to complain about their parents. That's good. That's <laughs> good. Like that would, uh -huh. Yeah. Would be a more specific way to, to phrase it. Okay. Okay. I like that. That's good. You like that? Yeah. 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 Okay. I can, I, I can definitely work with that. Okay. So I've been trying to bring my grand grandkids into the act, and I just haven't been able to figure out how to do it right. Okay, well, I'm not there yet because I don't want my, my daughter's twenty. I don't want her to have kids. No, right. no, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm not writing about that yet. Yeah. <laughs> so you got one for me? Well, I was just thinking about this today. I was thinking about the changing world because I went to the bank today, and you know they're so. They're so lonely, the people in the banks, <laughs> because nobody goes to the bank anymore because people are, you know, they've got all these these teller windows that are empty. And I was just thinking they could fill some of them. At one one um, window, you could take out your money, and then the next window, they could take bets. <laughs> because you'd be right there. I want $200, and then you move to the next window. I want to put it on Fancy Boy in the Fifth. So there you go. So I was just trying to figure out what else to do. And I also think some of them could get manicures because there's just all this space and nothing is being used. And then the other thing I was thinking is that, you know, no one's using money anymore because my, my plumber came and I didn't know. I said, can I give you cash? I don't take cash. Credit cards, no credit cards, check. No, I don't take a check. I said, well, what, how, how would you like to be paid? <laughs> And he said, you can, you can just sell me. And I said, well, I, I, I don't want to. <laughs> it sounds dirty. <laughs> so that's, that's, I just don't want to sell people. So I, I don't know. So I'm trying, those are my, my premises that I, I was working on that I might yeah. try. Yeah, th those are really good. I, I'm trying to think of what else you can do in a bank to fill up the space and at the same time, get rid of the loneliness of the poor people that have to sit there and wait for the two customers a day that come in. They're all doing their nails. So I'm just thinking manicures would be a good, I've never seen better nails than the people who work at these banks. They yeah. must be applying um, lacquer. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it could be something where you feel so bad for them that you uh, bring them in a piece of carrot cake every time you go. <laughs> maybe bring them a present or maybe they, another window could be used for therapy you yeah. go money out, do bets get your nails done and get analyzed about why you did those three things mm -hmm. so maybe you <laughs> kind of be in a line yeah yeah i like it yeah that's that's yeah, definitely that's, a winner yeah my two little thoughts and i have like thoughts like this the notes that they just keep getting bigger and bigger and and, and that i do in my little phone so i've got loads of those yeah yeah so just uh, real quick, you've got all those thoughts and notes. Do you, do, do you, my grandkids to complain about me. I want them to complain about their parents. I think yeah. that those those that thought is compartmentalized. Right, right. Yeah, I like that. On on the notes that you write down for yourself, do you have a um, so? Do you write it out on a notebook and then the ones that you want to go further with, you, you think it's something, do you put them in a new notebook or how, how do you organize just, things? I have no organization skills. I have no calendar. 
I've got nothing. I just, I have Martin. <laughs> he just came in. Martin tells me where I'm supposed to be. If he didn't tell me when I had to be at the airport and where I had to go, I'd never get there. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm very much the same. And I tried to just write on the computer. I got a note taking program and it's not the same. It doesn't, it, the thought process from funny to a, a computer is different than funny to a page. I do it both ways. No one way. I have the phone. I have Martin. I have my notebooks. I have, you know, my, just something I remember, you know, it's just really, everything is a jumbled mess in my head. Yeah. And I definitely use the phone for premises because I forget a premise 10 seconds after I Absolutely. find something that's fantastic. So I have to use a phone for that. He taught me how to do that. He said, yeah. do that. You gotta stop using your notebook. Give it to me. Let me show you. So he showed yeah. me. <laughs> and, and the and the voice recorder thing, you know, uh cats. You know? <laughs> I haven't and then, then you don't know what you why you said it. Day he used to go. I'm going to do this over and over so I remember how I said it so it'll be, be funny next time. It doesn't work like that. You've got to relive uh, it every time. Otherwise, it's not funny. I, I got to say, it's uh, it's been a real honor to have you on. When, when I look at the, the comedians that I loved, uh, both when I was a kid and as an adult, you know, I, I think of my top three and my first one was tom dreesen um and and the reason why i like tom is because i come from a super small town and didn't even have a stoplight and i felt like he was the big city guy and and he talked and i was close to chicago it was it was just outside of south bend indiana so i was close to chicago but i had never been there so i didn't know what a city was like so that's why i liked him and steve martin just because he was a goof um so non sequitur and you i always thought i i thought of you as being sophisticated when you're up there because you you um first of all you talked plainly you didn't um you didn't act like a kook on stage but you were um you presented yourself in a fashion that felt sophisticated to me it was everything is a happy accident yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show. If people want to um, find out where you're at or any of your projects you got going on, where can folks find you? They can find me on www.readerredner.com. Did I say it right, Martin? Readerredner.com. And yes. then um, my book is on Amazon and on my website. Yes. And there's lots of stuff in it about um, the, being on the getting on the Johnny Carson show. Living next door to Jennifer Lopez, writing the and lots of things we didn't talk about today that I think people might find interesting. Yes, it's a fantastic book from start to finish. I I think I finished it in three days, and uh, I, I read late, and uh, so I uh, stayed up late and didn't get much sleep those days. So that's your fault. Well, thank you um, for reading it. I really appreciate it, and thank you for having me on your show. Yes, thank you so much, Rita. Bye. Yeah.